Iran is sending mixed signals saying it will back a ceasefire approved by Lebanon and delay its attack on Israel, while indicating willingness to enter nuclear talks. At the same time, though, Iran showed off its latest weaponry and vowed that retaliation for the Israeli strike last month will come. All this amid unconfirmed reports that Iranian Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei is in a coma. More from ILTV's Steve Leibovitz. Iran says it backs any decision taken by Lebanon to secure a ceasefire with Israel. That's the word from Iranian Supreme Leader Khamenei's top advisor, Ali Larijani. Visiting Damascus, Larijani claimed that Tehran wants to see an end to the conflict that has dealt heavy blows to its Lebanese terror proxy, Hezbollah. Meanwhile, Axios is reporting that the Israeli Air Force hit a secret Iranian nuclear research facility during extensive airstrikes carried out against Iran last month. Quoting current and past U.S. and Israeli officials, Axios reports that the strike dealt a severe blow to Iran's nuclear development by hitting the Parchin military complex about 20 kilometers southeast of Tehran. The site has reportedly been used for testing explosives needed to set off a nuclear device. Iran has recently indicated that it will delay its promised retaliation against Israel until after the inauguration of President-elect Trump in January. At the same time, it vows that the attack will come. Over the weekend, the Islamic regime showed off some of its newest missile and air defense systems. And there were numerous unconfirmed social media posts over the weekend saying that Iran's 85-year-old supreme leader, Ali Khamenei, is in a coma after a serious illness. Three weeks ago, the New York Times reported that Khamenei was seriously ill. However, there is no official word from any sources about the further deterioration of the Ayatollah's health. The Times reported that a succession battle is underway in Tehran. Khamenei was last seen publicly on November 7th. And joining us now with more on the Iranian threat is Tamal Gindin, Iran expert from the Esri Center at Haifa University. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So there are unconfirmed reports that the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei has fallen into a coma and that his son will now take over we don't know if there's any truth to this claim as of yet, but Khamenei is said to be very ill. So, you know, what can you tell us about this? What do you know or don't know? And what will happen once he's gone? Khamenei is not young and not healthy. But as I think every other Middle Eastern dictator has been uh, announced dead or presumed dead um, about twice a week. Uh, in some years. It's not the first time that we hear these rumors. I would not rejoice or worry until we have confirmed reports from more, uh, more reliable sources. Right now we have one report from uh, a source that's, uh, that's very fast to, uh, to publish scoops, but not as fast in checking them. Mm -hmm. I see. And still, as you said, he is old, he is very sick, and people are starting to think about the day after Khamenei. There's rumors that he's appointed his son to take over. What can you tell us about his son? Does he share the same radical beliefs as his father? Uh, his son does share the same radical beliefs, but first, maybe let's talk about what happens after he dies. Uh, there is the assembly of experts an assembly of 88 experts who are elected once every eight years, and they're responsible to um, oversee the leader, the supreme le leader. Um, well, at least in the theory, they're also supposed to replace him if he does wrong. It, it has never happened. All their uh, meetings are secret. There was one meeting that, uh, that was leaked to the internet in 20. 16 from a meeting in uh, 1989 where Khamenei was appointed leader. So we don't really know what's happening there. And I think the reason that now these rumors are starting to spread, they're also responsible, of course, for electing the next leader, uh, the Imam Jom'eh, the uh, Friday preacher of the mosque in Esfahan, 
of the uh, main mosque in Isfahan, said on uh, last Friday, on his uh, last Friday sermon, that the assembly of expert experts has a subcommittee, which is very, very secret, only three people, and they have uh, examined possible uh, replacement, possible successors for Khomeini. Now, his son has been brought up as a possible successor, which he uh, is promoting for a couple of years now. Moshtaba Khomeini, his uh, second son, who's also a clergy. Um, we don't know a lot about him. He's not as active as, for example, uh, Khomeini's son, Ahmad, was when Khomeini, when Khomeini was about to be replaced. Um, and at that time, there were a lot of talks about Ahmad Khomeini replacing his father, succeeding his father, which didn't happen when his father died. Uh, another thing that Imam Jum'eh said uh, on Friday is that Khomeini himself asked the assembly to start discussing this before it's relevant, uh, possibly to prevent a situation where of a succession war that could weaken the regime and allow the Iranian people to take over Iran again. And I want to pivot uh, for a minute and ask you, you know, what is the feeling in Tehran regarding Trump coming back into power? You know, Trump has said he will reinstate sanctions, but Iran is in a different place today than it was in 2016. It's no longer an isolated country. I mean, what is your analysis of this? Um, on one hand, you're right, it's not no longer an isolated country because there are so many isolated countries now. Uh, Russia is also under sanctions, so they have like uh, an uh, alliance of, uh, of sanctioned countries, and, uh, and they do help each other. Uh, before the, the sanctions were lifted, I know that the Islamic Rep the Iranian people suffered, but the Islamic Republic did have its ways of bypassing the sanctions, and they're still traumatized by Trump's previous uh, presidency when he uh, stepped out of the JCPOA after the Islamic Republic made so much effort to sell the JCPOA and their agreement to be flexible with the West. They called it heroic flexibility, and they had to really explain to the people why they're doing what the West is telling them instead of fighting against the West. And then Trump comes in and just takes everything back and puts Iran into one of its most difficult uh, periods economically. So they are, on one hand, afraid of Trump. On the other hand, I, I also hear, I also saw a lot of happiness on social media. I don't know if it's Iranians from inside Iran or outside Iran. Um, and there's a little bit of optimism because the person who reached the JCPOA with Iran was Obama. He couldn't pass it in the Senate, but he did use his authority as president to not impose the sanctions, which Trump, an authority that Trump didn't use, but uh, on the contrary. All right. Well, Thamal Gindin, thank you so much for your analysis today. And we'll, of course, continue uh, to cover the Iranian threat. Thank you. An incoming rocket and UAVs continue targeting northern Israel today and over the weekend. Over 100 projectiles were reportedly fired by Hezbollah toward the Jewish state. There were also multiple launches targeting Safed and the upper and western Galilee. The Haifa Bay was heavily targeted with more than 35 rockets aimed at the city and surrounding communities. A synagogue was heavily damaged in the attack. The building struck was part of the U Ulanim synagogue complex in Haifa's Carmel Quarter. No one was in the synagogue when it was struck. And a small comfort for northern residents, but the IDF says it has seen a decrease in the number of rockets fired by Hezbollah at Israel in the past week, down to under 100 a day on average, compared with 150 to 200 a day last month and in the months before that. The IDF believes Hezbollah is struggling to carry out major barrages as most of its rocket stockpiles have been targeted and dozens of its commanders have been killed. And the Air Force has been relentlessly pounding Hezbollah in its sub South Beirut stronghold and has reportedly killed Hezbollah's media relations chief. Meanwhile, ground troops have advanced into a second line of southern Lebanese villages. 
And at the same time, the U.S. and Israeli ceasefire proposal is receiving a negative response in Lebanon. More from ILTV's Steve Leibovitz. Israel has been pounding Hezbollah positions in Beirut's Darkhia neighborhood and in cities and towns around Lebanon in a relentless degrading of its assets, especially missiles and missile launchers, as well as its commanders and Radwan fighters. The Lebanese media reports on at least eight waves of attacks in the Darkhia district of the Lebanese capital with multiple hits only minutes apart, blasting and dramatically changing the landscape in the Hezbollah stronghold. Heavy strikes were reported in the Beka Valley and in Nabatia and Tyre along the coast. Over the past day, Israel has attacked more than 100 targets in Lebanon, including weapons depots, command centers and launchers. There were also strikes reported in Syria. The Islamic Jihad confirmed that two of its commanders were killed in airstrikes near Damascus. The strikes reportedly targeted military complexes and Islamic Jihad headquarters at several locations in Damascus, with at least 15 reported killed. IDF ground forces reportedly advanced into 15 more Hezbollah-controlled towns in South Lebanon, with evacuations of civilians ordered ahead of the bombardments and the advance of troops into the towns. Ground forces reportedly advanced to a second line of villages along the border. Sergeant Ori Nisanovich, 21, of the Golani Brigade's 13th Battalion from Jerusalem, was killed during an exchange of fire with a Hezbollah gunman in a building in South Lebanon. Chief of Staff Alevi was in South Lebanon and said the war will go on until Israel's northern residents can return to their homes. Yes. הארגון הזה ימשיך לראות, אנחנו נמשיך להילחם, נמשיך לממש תוכניות, ללכת עוד קדימה, לתקוף בעומק, לפגוע בחיזבאללה, מאוד מאוד קשה. אנחנו נעצור שנדע שאנחנו מבינים את התושבים בביטחון. The Lebanese media is deeply skeptical over chances for a ceasefire between Israel and Lebanon. Editorials in Hezbollah-controlled papers rejected Israeli ceasefire terms that envision the Lebanese army disarming Hezbollah or allowing Israel operational freedom under a self-defense clause, calling it cover for further aggression. According to the Wall Street Journal, U.S. President-elect Donald Trump has approved the ceasefire framework aimed at ending the war in Lebanon. Strategic Affairs Minister Ron Dermer reportedly presented the proposal to Trump during a meeting this week. Trump reportedly expressed the hope that the plan could be implemented before his inauguration on January 20th. The U.S. Biden administration presented the draft ceasefire agreement approved by Israel. Special Envoy Amos Hochstein told Lebanese leaders that he will not return to Beirut until there is a deal ready for signing. Hopstein delivered the draft to Prime Minister Najib Mikati and Parliament Speaker Barry. Barry negotiates on Hezbollah's behalf. He struck an optimistic note, saying the atmosphere is positive and the work is progressing well. And three anti-government protesters have been arrested after allegedly firing flares outside the private residence of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in Kisaria on Saturday night. According to Hebrew language media reports, one of the detained is a senior officer in the IDF reserves. Security agencies said that there was no damage to Netanyahu's residence and that Prime Minister and his family were not at home at the time. Israeli politicians across the political spectrum from the coalition and the opposition condemned the incident. Among them, Justice Minister Yariv Levine, the architect of the legal reform, who underscored the seriousness of the violence of those who he said are trying to dismantle the country from within. Levine called for full support to restore the reform of the judicial and law enforcement systems to end what he called the anarchy and attempts to harm the prime minister. And just two days after the Palestinian Islamic Jihad terror group released a sign of life video of hostage Sasha Trufanov on the week of his birthday, the terror group released another video as they ramp up their psychological warfare attempts. Let's go to ILTV correspondent Devo Klein to break down what was in the video. Devo, what can you tell us? Yeah, Lidar, listen, it, it was a hard watch. It's blatant propaganda released by the Islamic Jihad. And it's not just propaganda being the second video released on Sha Sasha Trupinov's uh, birthday week. It's also propaganda because of the language being used. Now, we're not going to show the video uh, for our viewers, but I will describe what's in it. You see Sasha with a beard. 
Uh, obviously, when he was kidnapped uh, over a year ago, he did not have his beard. Um, so he looks very disheveled, and he is speaking directly to far-right leader, uh, Shas leader, uh, Arya Deri. There's Arya Deri in the background, and he is turning directly to him and pressuring him to get Netanyahu to come to some sort of deal. And this propaganda is, is very, very bad, and we need to stand against it. We need to stand united against it because of the rhetoric that is coming out of it. Uh, I have some research here from some Arab telegram groups as they uh, say, quote, the Israeli settlers protest for a prisoner exchange. And I want to make something very clear. Sasha Chubinov is not a prisoner of war. He is a hostage. He was not a military combatant who was kidnapped during duty. He was kidnapped from his bed on October 7th. And I think it's very important to make this distinction and to not let this sort of rhetoric kind of expand, uh, which is what the Islamic Jihad is trying to do. And, you know, meanwhile, while Sasha Trubinov sits in Gaza captive with over a hundred other hostages, the families and their loved ones protest for their return. Let's see the full report. The families of Israeli hostages still captive in Gaza are not giving up. As their loved ones remain captive for over 400 days, new routes are being taken diplomatically. In a visit to the Vatican in Rome to meet with Pope Francis, the families of hostages also urged Trump and Biden to work together to secure a deal. We hope that uh, with the election of Trump, together with Biden, this is not about the left or the right. All people should come together. We hope that Biden and Trump work together now to get the hostages back before the winter. Release hostage 70-year-old Luis Hal broke down in tears as he thanked the rescue efforts of the IDF to secure his release. As he sat next to the release hostage Yelena Trupanov, the mother of hostage Sasha Trupanov. While Yelena delegates for the release of her son, Sasha appears in a psychological warfare video, the second video released on the week of his birthday. Thank you, Devo, for the report. And now let's take a look at the Afeka Academic College for Engineering as they're working to ensure that every student has what they need to finish their degree, while also juggling their reserve duty in the IDF. We are now joined by Professor Ami Moyal, president of Afeka Academic College in Tel Aviv. Ami, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me here. So the school year has just begun once again under the shadow of war. What's it like to open another school year during these challenging circumstances? I think that there are two, two sides to it. One, the positive side. We have opened the academic year on time, unlike last year that it was delayed in three months due to the war. And we are having thousands of students with a lot of energy on campus. But from the other side, we have still hundreds of students that are serving in the army, that we are very proud of them, but we are preparing to assist them to complete the academic year. So FECA is known uh, for shaping engineers who meet Israel's high-tech demands by combining sort of the technical knowledge with the personal and professional development. How are student reservists managing to balance their education with their military service, and what steps is FECA taking to support them? Indeed, AFECA has implemented a profound change during the last years in the edu engineering educational process, putting an emphasis on uh, instilling skills in addition to knowledge. And that means that we have changed dramatically the pedagogy in class and students are more active. So in this sense, if they are missing classes, uh, it's very hard to uh, complete the, the missing uh, material. So we have developed a unique pro uh, uh, support package for all our reservists while we are grouping them into groups according to their needs. For example, there are students that are missing the whole semester due to army service. So for them, we have offered and opened again the whole courses at the second semester and during summer in order for them to complete the academic year, although they missed the full semesters. Another side is that there are groups of students that has missed only several weeks of the semester. In this case, we, we offer them personal support, tutoring, uh, group uh, learning and uh, support along the semester in order for them to complete the semester. But one conclusion from last year is that they need a personal 
uh, attitude and support in order to make the change from coming from the war to uh, study. And why is engineering education so critical for Israel's future? I mean, whether society, for the economy, national security? Israel's main resource is its human capital. The human capital is important for the high-tech industry, for the economy, for the society, and even for our national resilience and security. For many years, we are lacking in the number of engineers from the point of view of the uh, quantity, but we have put also the issue of quality that we need to educate engineers with skills and ethics that are more appropriate for the, the new era. So in this sense, it's very important that we will increase the number of graduating engineers from the uh, higher education system in order to support the, uh, the growth and the development of our high-tech industry and economy. And how does the war uh, affect this? Yeah, good question. In this sense, if the reservists would not complete their study at all or on time, the higher education system, not only AFECA, will provide our high-tech and economy uh, a smaller number of engineers while we need to increase this number. So in this sense, it's very important to support our students so they can complete their studies on time successfully and go to the high-tech market. And how can ILTV News viewers get involved or help support AFECA and the students? Oh, they can definitely get involved and support. The support package that I have mentioned earlier costs a lot of money and need a lot of resources. We receive some assistance from the government. We put some finance from our, uh, from our side, from our FECA resources, but we still need help in order to provide support to all of our students, academic support, financial support, and even emotional support. And in this sense, we are looking for partners to assist us and contribute to the emergency fund. All right, well, Ami Moyal, thank you thank so you much. Thank you very much. And moving on, the Israeli soccer team will match up against Belgium tonight amid heightened security following the violent pogrom that took place in Amsterdam last week. The game against Belgium follows the Israel-France match, which ended in an impressive draw of 0-0. The event was heavily secured as French authorities deployed 4,000 police officers to secure the stadium. There were no reports of major violence, and the Israeli athletes were reportedly all safe. Although this level of security is not anticipated at tonight's game in Belgium, security forces are on high alert as the country is home to over one million foreign nationals, the group that was responsible for targeting Israelis in Amsterdam. And we wish the Israeli soccer team much luck and much safety in their match tonight. Sagot Winery, where passion meets tradition. Nestled in the heart of Binyamin, our vineyards yield exquisite wines crafted with generations of expertise. And now, let's take a look at the weather forecast. Cloudy skies are expected around most of the country tonight with lows of around 14 degrees Celsius or 57 degrees Fahrenheit. Then tomorrow we'll see light drops with highs of about 20 degrees Celsius or 68 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's a wrap for today's news. For the latest updates from Israel on all your devices, be sure to follow our ILTV channel, subscribe to our newsletter, and explore our website, ILTV.tv. Stay informed with the latest news straight from the heart of Israel. I'm Adarka Velazi. Be well, stay safe, and thank you so much for watching.